Project Cancer Survivorship. There's a lot to talk about. So what I want to talk about today really is kind of what the landscape is for women with gynecologic cancer and specifically kind of emphasizing why we need to have a team approach to these patients. And, you know, cancer survivorship encompasses people who are living with, through, and beyond their cancer treatment. And so for the, the purposes of this talk, I wanted to talk about some of the issues that we see in women who've completed their gynecologic cancer treatment and what we kind of encounter with them in the long term. So I think we probably all know who a cancer survivor is, but I always think it's a really important topic to revisit because in the clinic, we got a lot of questions about, well, am I a survivor or am I in remission? So anybody who has been diagnosed with cancer, at, at that point thereafter, they're a cancer survivor, even if they have active disease, even if there are no evidence of disease, even if it's been 50 years. And I think this is a great definition because it really doesn't segregate people out. We're kind of one big group, um, and then people don't feel excluded. So a lot of the services that we're working on within the survivorship program here are for everybody, which I think is really great. Um, we have an increasing number of cancer survivors that's being driven by a couple of things. One is that we have an aging population, and so we're seeing more patients with cancer, but we're also getting much better about our treatments. And so if we take ovarian cancer, for example, about 20 years ago, 30% of people lived after diagnosis to five years. Now the five-year survival is close to 60%, even with people who have advanced stage disease. And that's because we're doing a better job about managing symptoms and uh, using some of these novel targeted therapeutics. And so we're going to see increasing numbers of cancer survivors for a number of different groups. Um, when we talk about cancer survivors for gynecologic cancers, we are seeing many, many more um, also being driven by uh, the increase in age. So a couple of things about women's health care in the context of cancer survivorship. So in 2007, the population of the U.S. was around 300 million people. In 2007, the number of practicing board-certified G1 oncologists was 655. So if we assume that half of the population is female, that's one G1 oncologist per 229,000 women. In 2008, there were 19,750 OBGYNs, one per 7,800 women. So the, my point in saying this is that there are not enough of us. Um, and as we see increasing numbers of women with cancer diagnoses, we're kind of running out of capacity, which means we need to employ alternatives and recruit more people to kind of help us out. And we know that the population in the US continues to grow. Um, by 2030, we see a market increase um, in the number of patients who are 65 and older. Those are the baby boomers. And then we're, we see a continued increase in the number of cancers. And so for, for females over the last 10 years, we've seen probably about a 40% increase. As oncologists, we're not keeping up with demand. And so when we look at the number of new cancer diagnoses versus the number of trainees who are coming out, you can see that these curves are really starting to deviate. And so this really underscores the fact that the physician cannot be the only one participating in cancer survivorship care. Now, we are doing some things to try and improve it. So we've increased the number of fellowships in gynecologic oncology. We're increasing spots in OBGYN residencies. But we get into a lot of nuances about do the OBGYNs who are generalists want to take care of cancer survivors? Uniformly, they kind of tell us no. Um, and so we've got all of these women who are long-term survivors. And again, we're outpacing our capacity. On top of all of that, our numbers are dropping, even though we want to kind of get more people involved. So in 2005, more than 60% of GYN oncologists were older than 50. And the average age of anticipated retirement per some big surveys done through the Society of GYN Oncology was 65. Um, and per this survey in 2005, the average number of years until expected retirement is 12. So that 12-year mark hit two years ago. And so we're even seeing a greater fall off in terms of GYN oncology. And so our focus really needs to be on people who've got new diagnoses and are receiving active treatment. And we need to utilize other resources for our patients who are on long-term surveillance. So this is kind of a big problem. Of GYN oncologists? That is very true. That OBGYN as well. So just women's healthcare in general in South Florida. 
Um, so if we look at our, our, our advanced math skills, we have more cancer patients who are living longer, we have a growing population, and we have fewer GYN oncologists, so we're slightly freaking out um, because we have a lot of work to do and we can't, like, we can't do it. So we need your help. Um, integrated care teams are absolutely crucial for successful post-treatment surveillance for women who've had a gynecologic cancer. And this All Hands on Deck is a fantastic paper that really kind of talks about the role for oncology nurses and for nurse practitioners to care for these patients in the long term. We know that patients after treatment are going to require post-treatment navigation. So we know that cancer treatment, yeah, you're done with your chemo, your radiation, but we are not done. There's a lot of other things that patients need to deal with. Patients require education and re-education and re-education about long-term side effects and late side effects. And some of the side effects that we see may not manifest until about 10 years after their treatment is done. Um, we need survivorship, plan care, survivorship care plan delivery and symptom monitoring. And again, there's not enough gynecologic oncologists. And so really this requires a team approach. And so my, my point in opening here is that everybody in this room plays a role in caring for these women who've gone through their cancer treatment. And so as we kind of evolve our survivorship program here, these are things that we need to keep in mind relevant to our patients. So let's talk a little bit about some disease-specific topics. I want to start with cervical cancer. And I want to talk about screening for recurrence, secondary osteopenia and osteoporosis, hormone replacement therapy in patients with cervical cancer, and then smoking cessation. So this is what cervical cancer looks like when somebody is first diagnosed. It is ugly and angry, and it bleeds. Um, we treat early-stage cervical cancer surgically. The majority of those patients need surgery without any additional treatment. If somebody has locally advanced cervical cancer, which means that it's bigger than four centimeters or maybe involving other pelvic structures, they're treated with whole pelvic radiation with concurrent chemotherapy as a radiosensitizer. That treatment is usually done very intensely, but is completed in about eight weeks. If somebody has advanced stage disease, meaning they present with liver metastases or lung metastases, those patients are unfortunately not curable, and we give them palliative chemotherapy. Fertility options are available for select candidates, although those are some very rare cases. I'm not going to hit on that today, um, but if somebody has an early cervix cancer, we can sometimes afford them some options to maintain their fertility. So once somebody has completed their treatment for, um, for their cervical cancer, the biggest thing that we need to do is a physical examination. And that means we need to physically look at the cervix, we need to palpate the cervix, and we need to do an assessment of the parametria. The parametria is the tissue that's on the lateral sides of the lower uterine segment. There are small lymph nodes there, and that's kind of the first area that cervical cancer will metastasize. And so we cannot underscore enough the importance of the pelvic exam. So when we're looking at care providers for these women, these have to be providers who are comfortable doing a thorough pelvic examination. We do obtain pap smears once a year for patients who have undergone treatment for cervical cancer. And this is just to look for any abnormalities because sometimes the recurrence may be subtle. At present, there is insufficient data to recommend any routine screening for any GYN cancer except for uterine sarcoma. And what we found is that doing routine screening doesn't translate into a survival benefit. We expose patients to lots of radiation with repeated CT scans, um, and that it translates into significant financial toxicity for the patients. If you think that somebody has recurrence, then you can image them. So if you see something on an imaging or you feel there's a change in their exam, those are reasons to image. We don't just do routine screening. So this is what a cervix looks like after it's been treated with radiation. So a normal cervix is gonna be very kind of pink and plump and healthy, and you can see this one's kind of white. You see those very skinny blood vessels on the surface. This is essentially a post-radiation or atrophic cervix. So when we're doing screening for surveillance, this is kind of what we're hoping to see. And we would do pap smears right along the cervix here. Now one thing that's important to recognize is that Abnormal pap smears after a treatment for cervical cancer are incredibly common. And that's because after somebody's had radiation, it changes the epithelium or the lining of the vagina. And so you really have to counsel the patient that an abnormal pap smear doesn't necessarily translate into a significant increase for recurrence. 
So this was a study that was done almost 10 years ago. It was a large retrospective study from a national database. And they found that one third of pap smears were abnormal in somebody who's had radiation for their cervical cancer. Um, most abnormalities were low grade. So something we call atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance or low grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. If the cervix looks normal and we have a low grade pap smear, we just say, great, we'll do your next pap smear in a year. So nothing that we need to do because the risk of these patients having a recurrent cervical cancer was less than 1% in this series. Now, if somebody has a high-grade abnormality on their pap smear, so something called atypical squamous cells cannot exclude high-grade pathology or HSIL, or if they have a visible lesion, then you need to do what's called colposcopy. So you kind of look with a little microscope on the cervix and take biopsies of abnormal areas. Or if there's a lesion, just take biopsies of the lesion because those are the patients who are going to have a higher risk for recurrence. And so it's really important when we're doing pap smears that when we call the patient and say, you had an, an abnormal pap smear, it's an ascus pap. It's nothing to be worried about. It's from the radiation. It's really important that the patient is counseled, not you have an abnormal pap smear, it's final seen a year. Because then the, I mean, as I think any of us would, you'd kind of freak out. Um, when, when women get whole pelvic radiation, it goes from L4, L5 right here, right to kind of right above the hips. We spare the femur so we don't increase the risk for, for hip fracture. But the amount of bone marrow that's covered in this area right here is about 25 to 30%. And that's a significant amount. And we know that as women get older, there's an increased risk for osteoporosis at baseline, particularly in terms of hip fracture. And so when we have patients who are receiving radiotherapy for their cervical cancer, we're increasing their risk for an additional pelvic fracture and at a younger age. The US Public Health Service Task Force recommends a DEXA scan or bone mineral density scan for somebody with risk factors at age 65. Um, if you have a younger person with a specific risk factor associated with increased fracture risk, such as low body weight, or in this case, radiation, you should calculate a FRAC score. And a FRAC score is actually something that was generated in the UK. And you can look at medications people have been taking, lifestyle factors such as smoking, a family history of fracture, medications, and then you can risk stratify whether or not somebody's going to be at increased risk. There was a study that was done out of MD Anderson several years ago that looked retrospectively at the number of patients who had a fracture after completing pelvic radiation. And all fractures even included very small stress fractures of the, of the pelvic bones. Um, that risk was 10%. And so a lot of these were kind of small stress fractures, but these were in, occurring in women even in their 20s and 30s. So we know that we're significantly increasing risk. Um, the radiation really interferes with kind of recanalization and new bone growth. So radiation kind of sclerosis or narrows down the blood vessels, and so nutrient delivery is not as good. Um, and then it interferes with the bony architecture. And so we are not just kind of breaking bone down, but we're, we're inhibiting repair of, of new bone. Um, and so when we are evaluating these patients, it's really important to consider doing additional bone density screening early because if somebody has osteopenia or osteoporosis, then that would be an opportunity to intervene for fracture prevention in the future. One other thing to think about is that estrogen is super important in terms of bone mineral density and maintenance and bone health. And that's why when women go through menopause, we see kind of the, the fall off of their estrogen. And that's when we really start to see the increased risk for osteoporosis. Your ovaries sit right down here. We give 45 gray of external beam radiation to the pelvis for the treatment of cervical cancer. And ovaries are dead at 15 gray. So if we're operating on somebody, sometimes we try and kind of like sew their ovaries up a little bit so they're gonna be out of the radiated field. That doesn't work all the time. But if you've got a young woman, a young woman and she's been radiated, she's menopausal. And so if you've got a patient who was 20 who got external beam radiation for her cervical cancer, we have now put her in menopause 30 years early. And so we know that there's going to be associated increased risk for osteoporosis and cardiovascular defect. Um, patients with cervical cancer also tend to have some other risk factors that um, are associated with bone loss, such as poor nutrition and smoking. And so addressing these things with them is important. And so it's really strongly encouraged to consider a bone density scan starting a couple of years after their pelvic radiation, or if somebody starts having symptoms in their pelvis to get an x-ray. Um, endocrinology is a great adjunct, um, especially because these patients tend to be a little bit more complicated and they can address osteoporosis with this.
I have a lot of patients ask about calcium and vitamin D. Um, and calcium supplementation is good, but you want to get it through your diet. Uh, there have been studies evaluating calcium supplements in, in the forms of things like Caltrate or Tums, and you actually see increased coronary calcification when you take the calcium tablets. Now, if you, uh, we want to get about 1,000 milligrams of elemental calcium a day, more or less. One serving of dairy is about 250 milligrams kind of on average. So what I tell my patients is that try and get four servings of calcium a day. So if you have a yogurt, and then you've got some cheese on your sandwich, and then you have another yogurt, you have a protein shake or whatever, then you can kind of calculate in your head how much calcium you've taken in. And then supplement if you hadn't gotten enough. So if you had a yogurt and some cheese and no more calcium, then you can take 500 milligrams of Tums to get that, that calcium baseline. Um, we know that there's an increased risk for kidney stones as well. And so I've had patients like chew their calcium, chew their calcium, because they're trying to be good patients, and then they're hypercalcemic, and they get constipated. And so we want to make sure that as much as we can in terms of diet uh, that we're taking it in. Um, let's transition to menopause <laughs> symptoms. So again, we have these young women who are getting their ovaries radiated, and so we're putting them into menopause. So hormone replacement therapy is safe in women with cervical cancer. There is no increased risk associated with administering estrogen by the specific disease types that they have. Um, you really have to take into account the patient's age when you're deciding what you want to treat them with. So what I found is that if you have a young woman, giving her birth control pills, you will get adequate serum estrogen levels, but then it, it allows them to feel some degree of normalcy because they're in their 20s or 30s and they're taking birth control pills like, they're, like their friends are. Um, if they're menopausal, um, you want to use combination hormone replacement therapy. So you can give estrogen to supplement, but you also need to give progesterone, which counteracts the effects of the estrogen because the uterus is still in place, and so you don't want to use estrogen to drive the growth of the endometrium or the inner lining on the inside of the uterus because you don't want to get a secondary uterine malignancy by treating the menopause in these patients who had cervical cancer. Now, in general, patients who are not good candidates for hormone replacement therapy are those who are not good candidates for estrogen in general. So if you have active cancer, estrogen is contraindicated because you'll significantly increase the risk for a DVT or a PE. If somebody has a known DVT or PE, that's an absolute contraindication for estrogen. Um, if somebody has very poorly controlled hypertension, they cannot get it because it will further exacerbate hypertension and you may potentiate a heart attack or a stroke. If somebody is smoking, you further increase the risk for hypertension associated with the smoking as well as the risk for DBT because smoking causes kind of microscopic injury to the endothelium within the, the veins. So what do we do if somebody can't take estrogen? Because it's really hard to have somebody with the little like fan that they plug into their phone sitting in front of you when they're 30 because they're like, I can't take these hot flashes. I can't go out with my friends. So we can use the SSRIs. Um, the American College of OBGYN has not updated their practice bulletin on the use of non-hormonal treatments for menopause symptoms since 2014. So this is the most updated data that we have. So we do know that an SSRI or an SNRI is effective. The only one that has been FDA approved is Paxil. Um, and so that doesn't mean that's the one that we use. Most of us don't go to Paxil first. Um, there's good data on Effexor. There's good data on Zola. There's good data on Prozac. Um, most of us go to Effexor first. The problem with Effexor is that if somebody wants to come off, it, there's a long wean off of Effexor. Things like Zoloft or Prozac, people can kind of wean off a little bit more quickly. The efficacy is about the same. Um, the issue with that is that sometimes people have a lot of hesitancy in taking an antidepressant to treat their, their symptoms. But compared to placebo, they are more effective in controlling symptoms. We can use things like clonidine and gabapentin. I've never once used clonidine in my life because it makes people hypotensive. They get rebound hypertension, and then they feel terrible. Um, gabapentin can be a good thing, although we don't use it as first line and don't use it that often. Um, there are no data on the use of supplements or herbs or vitamins. Does that mean I don't tell patients about it? No, I tell all of them about it. Um, especially after a cancer diagnosis, people tend to be a little bit more hesitant in wanting to take kind of medication. So anecdotally, vitamin E is good. Um, we can see good response with things like black cohosh or evening primrose oil. Those medications don't typically interfere with a lot of other treatments, and, um, and people kind of feel like they're doing something good for them.
So smoking cessation is absolutely crucial in patients with cervical cancer. We know that smoking potentiates kind of propagation of the disease, and so in terms of recurrence, smoking may be in effect. Um, unfortunately, only about 20% of patients will quit smoking after their cervical cancer diagnosis, and it's a huge problem. We did a big retrospective study when I was a fellow at MD Anderson looking at what happens when people complete their treatment for cervical cancer and kind of what resources we would need to mobilize for them. And what we found is if pa patients were smokers, they had a greater likelihood of referral to GI, pain management, and physical therapy. Um, we also know from very large databases that if somebody is a smoker during the radiation, they have much, much greater radiation side effects. So that's proctitis, so erosion of the rectum. Cystitis was erosion of the inside of their bladder. They have a higher risk for small bowel obstructions. So the end of the small intestine as it's going into the large intestine is within the radiated field. And so we see increasing rates for bowel obstruction in those women or distal rectal obstruction where the rectum kind of completely closes off and then they require a colostomy for diversion. So before a patient starts, it is crucial to tell them to, to stop smoking. Most will not stop smoking during treatment. This may be a good teachable moment um, at the end when you're like, hey, listen, we're done with treatment. Like, what can we do to improve our overall health? Um, referral to a smoking cessation program is great. We know the utilization of such programs is low. Um, but it's, you know, the onus is on us to really kind of encourage them to do that. Other issues in, in patients who've gotten radiation are vaginal stenosis. So the vagina can actually kind of agglutinate and close down. So at the end of treatment, we give patients vaginal dilators. So if they're not going to be sexually active. They need to use their dilator a couple times a week for 10 to 15 minutes. And there's two reasons for that. One is to maintain patency for sexual activity, but the other is that because the physical exam is so important in terms of surveillance monitoring. I need to be able to see your cervix to know if something is going on, right? And so opening your vagina allows me to see your cervix as you come in for your surveillance exams. Again, the proctitis and the cystitis we've talked about. So if somebody comes in with rectal bleeding or bleeding in their, or blood in their urine, those should prompt direct referrals to urology and um, colorectal or GI to physically look and make sure that there's not something that needs to be treated. Um, we see a lot of adjustment disorders, body dysmorphia, and anxiety as a result of this, more especially in young women. So if you've got a woman who is in her sexual peak in her 20s, and now we've radiated her, she's got chronic pain from it, she's different from her friends, she can't have a baby anymore, and now she has to use a dilator, and sex may be uncomfortable, we've completely changed her life. And so it is very important to get social work and psychology involved very early if there are any signs of distress with these patients. Okay, let's move on to endometrial cancer. So what I want to talk about in endometrial cancer is the kind of pathogenesis in terms of obesity and how we can account for that. And then is it safe to do hormone replacement therapy for endometrial cancer patients? So this is what endometrial cancer looks like. So remember the endometrium is the inside lining of the vagina. Um, this is an endometrial tumor here. This is the muscle part called the myometrium here that contracts when a woman's in labor. Um, standard of care does include a hysterectomy and removal of fallopian tubes and ovaries. We will do some sort of assessment of lymph nodes to make sure there hasn't been any sort of metastatic spread, although the approach to that kind of varies. The adjuvant treatment de depends on stage and the histology. What we know about endometrial cancer is that it actually tends to be symptomatic early. And so two-thirds of women are diagnosed when the tumor is still confined to the uterus. So the overall outcome for these women tends to be better. Um, only about 50% of people need surgery, and then that's it. So relative to other cancers, this is a very surgically treated disease. So we're going to have a lot of long-term survivors for endometrial cancer. If somebody requires adjuvant treatment after their surgery, it's typically a combination of radiation and chemotherapy, although the algorithm is a little bit um, complicated here. Palliative treatment for widespread disease, and again, fertility options are available for limited numbers of patients. So screening for endometrial cancer really depends on how low grade the tumor is and how high stage the disease was. And so the surveillance guidelines include, again, a very thorough pelvic exam look at the top of the vagina where the uterus used to be because that's the greatest place where we're going to see a recurrence. Um, counsel patients about whether or not they've got symptoms. So the biggest symptom that we worry about is vaginal bleeding. So if somebody's had a hysterectomy and then they've got vaginal bleeding again, something not right is happening. 
Um, PAP test is not indicated. And I will show you a slide in there. It's just because the detection of any abnormal cells for endometrial cancer is incredibly low. Um, CA125 is a tumor marker that we use for ovarian cancer. It may have a little bit of utility, but by far not for the majority of our patients here. Radiographic imaging is not routinely indicated. So again, if a patient has a new symptom or a new finding on our exam, that should prompt uh, evaluation by imaging. So when I was a resident eons ago, we used to do a pap smear every three months on these women with endometrial cancer. And what a waste of money that was in hindsight. Um, there was a large retrospective study that came out about five years ago with more than 2,000 women that showed that only 3% of paps that were done on women with endometrial cancer were abnormal. And most of those didn't correlate at all with any sort of tumor recurrence. Um, most of them were in patients who had prior radiation before. And so when we did our cost-effective analyses, doing a PAP is really kind of meaningless, and it generates a lot of anxiety if it comes back abnormal, especially in the setting of radiation. So we don't do this anymore, um, and it's really important to counsel your patients that we're not ignoring something. It's just not indicated in their case. So this is very busy. The point of this is that the pathogenesis for endometrial cancer, for the majority of endometrial cancers, is really complicated. Um, there is an enzyme called aromatase, which exists in the fatty tissue of all of us. And what aromatase does is it converts testosterone that's generated by your adrenal gland into estrogen. So think for a second about the menstrual cycle. So I'll give you the 30-second uh, menstrual cycle update. So the first half of the cycle, the ovary is cranking out estrogen. And what that estrogen does is it makes the endometrium grow in preparation for supporting a fertilized egg. When you ovulate and the egg is released, there's a cyst that forms on the ovary called the corpus luteum. And that secretes progesterone, which kind of counteracts the effects of the estrogen. And the progesterone is important because it further makes the endometrium like really receptive to implantation of an embryo. If you don't have, if you don't get pregnant, then that little corpus luteum cyst just kind of degenerates, and then you have your bleed. So imagine that you are 65, and there is something in your body cranking out estrogen that's making your endometrium stimulated, but you're not having periods, so there's not that progesterone trigger to kind of counteract that. So when we have women who are morbidly obese, they have a lot of this aromatase enzyme. So they're generating a lot of endogenous estrogen. So their estrogen levels are kind of through the roof. And what that estrogen is doing is stimulating their endometrium to grow. And there is nothing counteracting that. And so the biggest risk factor for the majority of patients with endometrial cancer is obesity. And for low-grade endometrial cancer, these are the patients we see who come in with BMIs of 40, 45, 50, um, and their tumor is being generated purely because they're overweight. 90% of women with low-grade type endometrial cancer are overweight and obese. We also know that their risk of mortality increases even when their obesity isn't significant. I mean, 30, a BMI of 30 is technically obese, um, but I mean, not like a BMI of 50. Um, if your BMI is 40, then your mortality from endometrial cancer is increased by 177%. Um, there is no association between progression-free survival and BMI, but we know that independent of endometrial cancer, obesity is a huge problem in the cancer space. So one out of every five cancers in women are related to obesity, which is just insane because this is something that we can very easily fix. So we know that colon cancer, breast cancer, kidney cancer, esophageal cancer are all increased in women who are obese. There's some data, too, that ovarian cancer may be increased in women who are obese. The risk of mortality in a morbidly obese patient with endometrial cancer is usually not because their cancer comes back. It's because they have other comorbidities that um, are to which they succumb. High blood pressure, diabetes, stroke, coronary artery disease, peripheral vascular disease. And so it's really important as we come to the conclusion of our endometrial cancer treatment, which again, in 50% of the cases is just surgery and say, what are we gonna do to help you lose weight? because you're not, you're not gonna die of your endometrial cancer. Your hemoglobin A1C is 13. Like that is gonna be the thing that down the long term is really gonna be a problem. So how do we use this kind of teachable moment to make sure that our patients are doing all that we can?
So when we talk about recommendations for exercise, the American Heart Association recommends 150 minutes of moderate level exercise a week or 75 minutes of vigorous activity or some sort of combination of the two. And by moderate exercise, that means you need to get your heart rate up. You need to be breathing a little bit heavy. Vigorous exercise is like you're doing CrossFit or you're sprinting or doing intervals or something like that. Um, and it's really important to utilize services such as an exercise physiologist that may facilitate this, but also make it not an intimidating thing for the patient because these may be people who've never been to a gym, who don't know what it's doing or may not be able to afford going to a gym and need to set really small goals. So you're going to say, okay, so five days a week, we're going to do 30 minutes of walking. Let's start with that. But you don't have to do 30 minutes at a time. You can do 10 minutes. So I tell my patients, I was like, when you take your work break, walk outside for 10 minutes, then come back. And then a couple hours later, walk 10 more minutes. It, it takes a little bit of time. And over time, they can really kind of build up their endurance. It's really important to optimize nutrition. So utilizing dietitians and nutritionists is crucial so that we can modify patients' diets and their healthy eating habits. Um, I'm sure everybody in this room has had a patient who has poor eating habits because of something they've read on Google, or they think something's healthy and it's not, and we really need to use this moment to educate about what is good and how we should be kind of diversifying our diet. You really have to advocate for your patient, and this is not a one-visit kind of discussion. This is a, every time I see you, we need to address this because these are things that are really fixable and have distinct uh, implications for survival. So because we know endometrial cancer is hormone sensitive, there is a lot of concern about giving hormones to somebody if they had symptomatic, a symptomatic menopause after they had their hysterectomy. Um, and a lot of patients are hesitant to do that. But we know that 60% of patients or 50% of patients will require radiation with all of the vaginal effects that we talked about with the cervical cancer patients. So dryness, stenosis, estrogen can help with that that there's significant alterations in sexual functioning as a result of that. And because of the obesity epidemic in the United States, we are seeing women diagnosed in their teens with endometrial cancer because they are morbidly obese. And so again, if we've got a young woman who's got disease that requires a hysterectomy, what are we doing to kind of supplement that? So there was a trial that was done by the gynecologic oncology group in the early 2000s that sought to answer whether or not giving people hormone replacement therapy was, was safe. Um, this did not accrue that well because people were kind of freaked out about taking hormone replacement, which is not unreasonable. But even with the small group, they saw that there was no difference in survival or recurrence, that most of the patients who got it had really kind of low-risk disease, um, and that we knew that African-American women had an increased risk of recurrence before, and so the utilization of hormone replacement probably isn't translating into something specific for minorities. Um, we've had two retrospective trials that also show it's safe. So if I have a woman who comes in and she had her ovaries out with her uterus and she's 35, and her quality of life is terrible, I have no hesitation in giving her hormone replacement therapy at a low dose as long as she understands that the data is a little bit unclear, but it appears to be safe. Um, we can do that, but then you also use the opportunity to have her do diet and exercise, because if people lose weight, then they're also decreasing their endogenous estrogen, which may be beneficial in the long term. So overall, women who've got low risk early stage endometrial cancer, it's probably safe. If somebody is a high risk histology or they have kind of some of these rare sarcoma tumors. We don't, we don't give them hormone replacement therapy. Um, and again, if somebody's got a medical contraindication to estrogen, we can't use it. But much like cervical cancer, if we've got symptomatic menopause and there's any hesitation in terms of using hormones, then we can always use the SSRIs or some of the natural substances. And again, there's ring, patch, cream, lots of other things, and you can really kind of tailor it to the patient. Let's transition to ovarian cancer. So I want to focus on methods of surveillance and then kind of the genetics and assessment of family risk. So ovarian cancer is terrible. There is no screening test for ovarian cancer. So patients present the majority of the time with advanced stage three or four disease. The symptoms of ovarian cancer are very nebulous and it is very common for patients to have seen their PCP, 
GI, urology, all before they come to see me. Symptoms are nonspecific bloating, dysuria, alternating constipation, diarrhea. These are all really kind of common things. And so if somebody comes to you and they say they're bloated, cancer is like way down on the list because statistically they probably have IBS or GERD or constipation or something like that. And so most patients have gone through that kind of algorithm before somebody ends up getting a CT scan and sees that they've got disease. Ovarian cancer is very responsive to chemotherapy initially, but the majority of patients, and by that I mean more than 90% will have a recurrence. And if the tumors recur, they are not curable. The good thing is that we do have increasing numbers of really effective treatments for patients with ovarian cancer. Most of the research in the GYN oncology space is in ovary. And so we're seeing people live a lot longer. Um, but we counsel them that this is gonna be something like a chronic disease. So just like you take your pill for diabetes or blood pressure, you're gonna need your treatment for your ovarian cancer. Unfortunately, they will eventually succumb to their disease. Um, when somebody has completed their adjuvant um, chemotherapy, everybody goes on a surveillance plan. It's very intense kind of early on, and then once they're two years out from completion of chemo, we can kind of space it out a little bit. The majority of recurrences are actually gonna be in the pelvis and palpable on exams. So just like every other tumor, pelvic exam is really, really important. Um, we also check a CA-125 frequently. CA-125 is elevated in about 90% of women. So it can be a good, useful adjunct to use for surveillance. Um, the problem with CA-125 is that we addict our patients to the CA-125. And there have been papers about variations in anxiety as patients come for surveillance. So they hear their CA-125, it's normal, their anxiety goes way down. And then over the next three months, when they trend their anxiety longitudinally, you can see it starts to increase and it peaks right before the next visit. And it's because we're holding on to that number. CA-125 is really nonspecific. It does not mean ovarian cancer. It's really a measure of inflammation in your peritoneum or your abdominal cavity. And so lots of other things can make your CA-125 go up. Fibroids, endometriosis, colitis, diverticulitis, heart failure, liver failure, all these things can make it go up. And so it's really important to take it in clinical context. So if I have a patient who comes to me for surveillance and she says, oh, I was admitted last week for diverticulitis, and her CA-125 is like through the roof, that's not a really good marker. So it's important to keep it in, in context. Um, the trend is more important. So we know there's gonna be a little bit of variation because the assay will vary day to day. And actually studies have shown there can actually be about 15% difference from test to test. Um, if we start to see a doubling or tripling of CA-125, that's significant. But if somebody's CA-125 goes from 12 to 13, that's essentially the same thing. Um, but again, it requires a lot of counseling with the patient so that they don't get so worked up. Because we will have patients where if it changes by decimal points, they're worried that it means something. Um, and this lasts for a long, long time. And it's really hard to kind of like pull the back. There, there was a study done in the UK in 2012 that actually looked at blinding CA-125. And if patients should know about their CA-125, because is it really a good clinically meaningful tool? And what we found is that in patients who did not know their CA-125 and had imaging based on new symptoms or exam finding is that they lived the same as patients who knew their CA-125 had better reported quality of life and received overall fewer cycles of chemotherapy. So I talk to my patients about whether or not they want to follow their CA-125. 100% of the time they do. Um, but you know, it's really important that we understand that it's just one piece of the puzzle. Routine imaging is not recommended for all of the reasons that we had discussed before. Patients will ask about it. They want it every three months or six months. And so it's really important to, in some ways, kind of dial that back. Um, imaging for ovarian cancer has been reported to increase surveillance cost um, almost eight times compared to CA-125 alone. And so again, the financial toxicity in these women who are now living longer can be significant. So genetic testing is really important for women with ovarian cancer. One out of every four women with ovarian cancer will have a hereditary mutation that predisposes them to this. And it's important to identify this early as their treatment options are gonna be expanded based on their genetic testing results.
The most common mutations are in the hereditary breast ovarian cancer syndrome or that Fanconi anemia pathway. BRCA1 and 2 are the most common. There are other non-BRCA mutations like rad 51 c and D, PALB2, BRIP1, that are all in that same kind of protein complex that are going to have the same kind of risk. Um, there's actually an increased risk for ovarian cancer in Lynch syndrome patients as well. Um, the NCCN recently updated their recommendations um, such that any patient who's got an ovarian cancer needs genetic testing, regardless of the histology. And it used to be only certain histologies or certain subtypes, but now everybody needs testing. And so in the first several months within our clinic, we do our genetic testing, and that helps us kind of re-stratify. Now, if somebody doesn't have a cancer diagnosis, going through their family history is really important. But if somebody has a cancer diagnosis, it really kind of helps us with the cascade testing. We'll talk about that in a second. Now, it's really important to reassure your patients that testing is safe. This is protected by HIPAA. Your insurance companies cannot use this to deny coverage. And so it is so important for them because it will affect their treatment directly, but also for their family members who may have the opportunity for more intense screening or risk reductive surgeries. So when we talk about cascade testing, that means that we are identifying other members of the family who've got a BRCA or other mutation based on the proband, who is the patient we're seeing in front of us. So if I have a patient who has a BRCA mutation, we ask her, do you have siblings? Do you have children? These are autosomal dominant mutations, so there's a 50% chance of passing them along. So sisters and uh, brothers and sisters get tested. Sons and daughters get tested. Parents get tested. And then any one of those that's positive, we subsequently go through their families to find out who requires testing and their family. There is no screening test for ovarian cancer. We don't do C125, we don't do ultrasound. All we have is a well woman exam. And the positive predictive value for a well woman exam in ovarian cancer is abysmal. So this is really the only tool that we've got to try and identify patients before they get ovarian or fallopian tube cancer um, to facilitate kind of reduction um, of this disease. It's also important to remember that patients don't get one cancer and that they can't get any cancer ever again. Um, so we need to make sure that our patients are up to date on mammography. Remember, one in eight women in the United States gets breast cancer. So if somebody has ovarian or endometrial cancer, that doesn't mean you can't get something else. So mammography is important. Make sure they get their skin exams, that they get their colonoscopy. Patients hate colonoscopy, but persist. Um, they need a vulva vaginal exam, so they still need to get their well woman exam. We need to look at the outside of their genitalia. Head and neck evaluation, chest imaging if there is a significant smoking history. And then consider the more intangible. So we really kind of focus in the physician visits about risk of recurrence and addressing the medical things. But this is such a small component of what patients experience as they've gone through their cancer treatment. There is significant financial toxicity, especially for women who are young, who've had to leave their work or their family, um, who are gonna have diseases that may persist for a long time. Some of our cancers, patients can live for years and it comes back and then they get treated and financially that takes a huge toll. What's the effect on relationships? Again, with all of the changes in, in sexual functioning, it can be really challenging for a woman to find an intimate partner if she's having the side effects from her treatments. And so we need to be cognizant of that. Psychosocial well-being, family dynamics are important. Body dysmorphia is huge. And so if you see a patient who is experiencing this or telling you about it, they absolutely need to be referred to psychology. Social work is crucial for helping patients with coping strategies. The anxiety about recurrence is real. And I think of any of the non-medical issues that we deal with, anxiety about recurrence is probably the thing that we deal with the most and that our nurse practitioners and nurses deal with the most. And it's hard. So if a patient is willing to see psychology about this, that is incredibly helpful. Because I tell my patients, the whole point of doing your cancer treatment is to allow you to live and have good quality of life. And if your quality of life is now perseveration about is my cancer coming back, then we're not helping you. So we need to make sure that we put them in the right place to allow them to talk about these issues. Fertility, we try to deal with upfront. It can be really hard. Sometimes we gotta get treatment started right away. I don't think that's unique to GYN cancers at all. Um, 
increasingly there are a number of modalities that patients can use and the REIs that we've got actually here in the community are really good about trying to get people in really quickly. But even if patients do all of these things and they lose uterine function or ovarian function, it can still be really challenging for them, especially when they're meeting new partners and have to tell their new partner that they're not able to bear children. Um, and so an ongoing dialogue and making sure that they're seeing the appropriate specialist is really important. And finally, survivors are normal people. Um, I have patients who come to me and say, you're going to be my PCP. I am not going to be your PCP. <laughs> I, I don't know the updated medications for high blood pressure or the algorithms for that, or that, like, I see these things, like, on, on TV about these new diabetic medications. Like, I don't know what that is. So your PCP can deal with that, because that's their role. That's what they were trained to do. Just like your PCP, you tell them that you think you've you got some vaginal bleeding after you, your cancer diagnosis, they're going to say, go see your oncologist. So it's really important that the patients understand this is still a team approach in terms of um, diversity and the medical providers. We need to check blood pressure, diabetes, thyroid, and cholesterol, liver, kidney function, vitamin deficiencies, GI function, infectious illnesses. They need their vaccines. That can all be done through the primary care office. So that's all I have for today, and we've got four minutes to spare. So thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. So the current recommendation is 21. Um, and no, that's a great question. So about 10 years ago, the guidelines were all over the place depending on the specific organization. So they've all kind of coalesced their recommendations into a single unified one now. So the recommendation is that cytology only, so just a pap, not checking for HPV starting at age 21. As long as that's normal, it's cytology every three years until age 30. And then at age 30, we start doing co-testing. So that's cytology, so checking the cells plus HPV. As long as those two are negative, the recommendation is every five years. We don't check HPV in young women because everybody has HPV. If you are a man and you've had sex before you turn 50, there's a 90% chance you've been infected at some point with HPV. And for women, it's 80%. And who are, what's the group of people who are most sexually active? Women in their 20s. So what, what we found is that we had when we were looking at onset of sexual activity or you know, using kind of younger teenage years, is that let's say a young girl, her, her sexual debut is at age 12. Then we're doing pap smears at age 15. And that translated into ablative procedures and excisional procedures and lasers and all these things on these young women and down the line that translated into poor obstetric outcomes. So we basically shaved their cervix off and then they had preterm labor premature cervical dilatation. And none of that is really necessary because we know that young women, aside from some sort of immunosuppressive disease, are very robust in terms of their immune response to, the HP to HPV. And so most of these women who are infected at young ages, they're going to clear their virus and it's never going to be an issue. Um, as an add-on to that, the Gardasil vaccine, the HPV vaccine, is crucial. Everybody should get it. The FDA expanded the indication up to age 45 last year, um, men and women. Um, and so we know that if children get it at the appropriate age, so that's between like nine and 13, they require two shots. Us old folks require three shots because our immune <laughs> systems are quite the same. Um, but we, see, we have seen already significant risk reduction in terms of abnormal cervical cytology. And remember, a number of diseases are caused by HPV, head and neck cancers, cervical cancer, anal cancer, vulvovaginal cancers. And so this really is a cancer vaccine. So another way to like be involved is to make sure the patients are adequately counseled about the vaccination. Yeah? What constitutes a For like a surveillance exam? So we look on the outside, so we should look at the labia, the skin around it, the clitoris. We do a full evaluation of the mucosa of the vagina all the way up to the cervix. We look at the cervix, um, pap smear if indicated, and then it's a bimanual exam. 